Right, okay. Um, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first uh, Behavioral OR uh, Summer School. I'm very excited to be here with you. Uh, I've been looking at your, um, um, your CVs and your applications, and I was very pleased to see um, a wide variety of backgrounds and interests. And I think, uh, as Raimel says, um, um, we're probably making history today because you are what we see as the, as the future of, of this community, this emerging community. So um, we will have time during the week to, to get together and, and to know each other a little bit about uh, you know, what you're doing and you know, what we're doing. Um, so and, um, we'll, we'll have time for that. Today is a, is a day where we're going to be doing um, some problem structuring um, uh, methods and uh, talk a little bit about uh, um, behavioral issues in problem structuring and have the opportunity to experience problem structuring uh, as well. Um, problem structuring is, 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 is a, a topic that unless you actually do it, uh, you, you cannot really learn it. You cannot read it. You cannot read about it, really. You have to do it. Uh, and we'll see how it goes. You, know, you, never, you never know. So you, you, might, you, you, might, you might find it useful, you might not. But uh, I'll, I'll do my best to persuade you that uh, problem structuring is really a key in most of um, interventions that use uh, any sort of model-based support. But before that, um, I was asked to do a, an introduction to what behavioral OR is or might be, or you think it is. Um, and so before I start with that, um, I'd like to ask you a question. What do you think, uh, when you think about behavior, what do you think uh, uh, is, is, is behavior? Um, because I, I, from you know, having been working with Brimo for the last three years on this subject, um, I read a lot of work that treats behavior uh, in OR, um, uh, but they all do it differently. So, um, and, I, and by reading your applications, I also have a guess that um, you also understand it differently, which is good, it's not bad. Uh, uh, in fact, I would encourage uh, to have a wide diversity of, uh, of lenses or perspectives in terms of behavior, but what do you understand by behavior? Can I ask that question to you? Who wants to, you know, uh, venture themselves to, to speak out in the class? With the risk of no, nobody actually saying anything, but um, <laughs> as my, um, my colleagues at Loughborough says, if you just keep quiet for about two, three minutes, somebody will crack and, and say something. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very patient, so I can, I can wait. What do, you, what do you understand by behavior? Okay, how people react to a particular situation, okay? Anybody else? Yeah? I would say how they interact in particular situations with how each other. How they interact, you know, interaction, okay. Make decisions. How they make decisions, okay. How they do things which uh, appear strange and paradoxical and not necessarily in their best interest. The weird things that we hear. Okay, so some sort of and intuitive, perhaps, you know, um, um, moving away from an intended norm, perhaps. Okay. How people deviate from uh, mathematical models. Yeah. Also, how people sort of, uh, uh, you know, follow something that is not, no, doesn't follow a, a rational principle or a, or a normative principle of decision making. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Derive action from their mental models, or maybe changing their mental models. Uh huh. Okay. So, how you know what you're thinking informs what you're doing. Yeah. Anybody else? Yep. Yeah. Uh, something changes in response to something. Okay. Like system behavior. Okay. So like a so the system. Okay. A system behavior change. Fine. Maybe culturally agreed ways of living together. Doing things, exchanging. Okay, so so, so it's a, a framework for behavior, some sort of yeah. Okay. Pattern of moving. How? Pattern of moving. Pattern of moving. Yes. So patterns uh, of here. Um, interestingly, 
Um, I think you're all right. You know, there are all ways of understanding behavior. I'd like to see, uh, uh, from, from my understanding of what is published out there in terms of you know, behavioral studies in OR-supported work, um, many people understand behavior as observed behavior. So you know, they, they look for behavioral change you know, in the real world, as, as if you want to say that. So how people are changing the way they are interacting, how people are making decisions, you know, how people are moving away from rationality, and so on. But there's also a big chunk of work where uh, people are not really looking at observed behavior, but they're trying to infer what people are thinking as a precedent from behavior. So uh, when people are thinking, for example, <coughs> at studying intention, you know, so what, 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 what goes on in your head before you're making the decision, because that's going to inform that. That's, that's I would say, pre-observed behavior, but it's also related to behavior because it has consequences for action. And I'm quite happy with both, both streams of work. Uh, I'm not a psychologist, so I don't really mind uh, having both uh, you know, um, arguments uh, on, the same, on, the, on the same plane. But if you were a psychologist, there are big debates about you know, whether you are a behaviorist or not, you know. So behaviorists, they say you only can measure what you can see and observe. And, and those who are not behaviorists say, no, no, we have to go into what you're thinking, really. Uh, I am I'm comfortable with both. So if you find yourself and you're looking at studying what goes on in your head, it's fine. Now that we have, uh, you know, neuroscience research, there's a lot that we know <laughs> what goes on in, in your head in terms of your brain and so on. So perhaps that's, that's the future. Uh, but if you are only observing behavior, as it happens, uh, uh, in response to, let's say, an OR supported process, then that's fine too. Okay. Now, uh, this issue of behavior and, uh, and operational research, we, we, right when I say it is a, a resurgence, you know, we, the, the interest is something that is not really new because it was there from the beginning. And in fact, some of my colleagues in the World Society say, well, we've been doing this forever, so what's, what's the big deal? Well, it, I w hopefully, after this talk, I will, I will make it clear why um, um, it seems that you know, we are experiencing a resurgence of, of this, um, this area. But yes, originally, um, OR was all about um, understanding operations and how people were doing things, and then developing some sort of model of that system, uh, usually in those days were mainly mathematical models. But that was, a, that was, it was an attempt to model behavior. And that has stayed with us throughout, but perhaps what Raimo pointed out earlier is that um, throughout the years, we forgot about the behavior and we just got completely and you know, we fell in love with the mathematics uh, because mathematics are beautiful, of course, um, but then we forgot the behavioral aspect. Um, so back in the 50s and 60s, you know, people like Churchman and Aikov were all thinking about behavior is important, models are known in mathematics. Uh, in the 70s and 80s, uh, we had uh, uh, the systems people uh, with going back to behavioral issues like in the UK, Mark Jackson uh, uh, and his systems uh, uh, colleagues were engaged in big debates about, uh, uh, you know, uh, about behavior and the need to consider behavior in systems. Uh, but sort of a, that interest kind of a, uh, stopped for a bit. It, it, it's not that people forgot, it's just that it was put to one side. Um, and you can see that in, in terms of the journals in OR, some journals are very, very much sort of a method focused and mathematically oriented and others are very practitioner oriented and they have little mathematics in it. Um, and so uh, when Reimer published his paper on the behavioral OR, uh, it caused a lot of steer in the community because he was making the point, and that paper is basically about how you communicate with models, really, and how sometimes ways in which you present results or findings actually change the way people behave. Um, and that was quite refreshing for me when I uh, read that paper because um, I noticed that we weren't even talking about whether the model was effective or not, but whether the way we, the things that we do with models actually make any difference at all. 
Uh, and that, that, that uh, is something that I will explore uh, um, today in, in the problem structure, but also in this session. So, I think, uh, yes, it is something that uh, is a sort of a, 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 a rebirth of behavioral OR, perhaps, or the interest in behavioral OR. Um, and I need to. Yeah, thank you. So, but what, uh, whether you, you, you understand behavior as observed behavior or, or, or something related to uh, cognitive processes, uh, I think what is common, or what we all share, those who are interested in behavioral art, is a commitment to empirically examine uh, behavior. And, and usually uh, um, it's about understanding what people do in a system. So if you are building a simulation model, whether it's an agent-based model, or whether it's a, a discrete event simulation model, you're trying to understand what goes on in that system. So that's one way of doing that. But also, and this is the point that Ramon was making in his paper, is about what, what impact behavior has on the use of models or what impact the use of models has on behavior. So uh, Stuart Robinson once made this difference in the, I think in the first behavioral OR stream uh, uh, at the Euro conference, or was in I4, I4, I think, where he talked about uh, behavior in models versus behavior with models. I think that's a useful comparison because behavior in models is all, you know, sort of the modeling efforts that we are engaging in to understand the behavior of the system. Uh, so when you are doing an agent-based simulation model, you're trying to model behavior in that system. But uh, behavior with models is about what changes, you know, happen in behavior as a result of using particular methodologies uh, or methods or tools. So. The behavioral OR orientation covers both. Uh, perhaps the first one is something that people in the community might claim that we've been doing it for a long time. And I accept that. So now, uh, uh, perhaps, what we're looking for is for more novel developments in terms of modeling behavior. Things that actually might work better now than before. The second one, though, is actually more uh, is new in a way because in the OR community not many uh, scholars have been actually paying attention to this. In other fields they do, information systems for example, they've been studying a lot of behavioral issues in the use of group decision support systems for example. But within OR uh, is something that is only been touched upon um, but it's increasing. And we, we, we uh, confirmed this by the special issue that we published this year. Uh, there, there is a lot of on the first type of you know, work, but it's increasingly more and more studies devoted to the second, and the second aspect. So that's that. Um, so modeling behavior and evaluating how behavior affects or is affected by the use of models are sort of like the two streams that run in parallel. They complement each other. Okay? Right, so that's the orientation. Now, uh, if you are new to the field, um, how do you go about studying behavioral issues in OR? Whether you are uh, uh, um, something that somebody who is interested in modern behavior or whether you are somebody who is interested in understanding how behavior is changed by, by OR. And, and, and for that, we need to, to look elsewhere because OR is fundamentally a practical or applied domain. So there's not a lot of theory in it. Uh, um, um, we use a lot of tools, but there's not a lot of theory. Uh, 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 so we, we need to look outside uh, uh, OR for theories that might help us. And one of the, um, the theories that I, I find particularly useful to inform my work are theories of practice. In the social sciences, you know, um, there's, a, there's a long tradition of studying uh, um, actual practice, what people do at work, you know, work studies, you know, practice studies. And within the management, uh, there has been a recent, uh, well, not so recent now, but um, um, it's, it's now something that is really uh, established, but uh, studying practice, uh, the practice of those who engage in strategy making, for example, is something that um, um, uh, had, had, had already a, 
uh, a, stronger, a stronger tradition of work. And within that, uh, the work of Richard Whittington is, some, is something that uh, it has informed uh, my ideas uh, about behavioral art. And one of the, the things that these um, theories of practice uh, address or pay attention to are three things. When you are looking at behavior, they're thinking, well, these are the three questions that you need to be thinking about. What is that is guiding that behavior is one thing. Uh, whose behavior is actually you, you're looking into? And how behavior is enacted in practice? So those three things should inform any studies on, on behavioral law. Um, because if you are able to um, address those three questions or find answers to those questions, you are more likely to understand or produce explanations of why things are changing. Okay? So uh, if you do that, then what guides behavior in our case, in our context, would be the methods, the tools, and the methodologies that we use. Because if we have a particular method uh, that we apply to, to an individual to make a decision or to a group to, to make a decision or to an organization to reach a conclusion, you are providing a set, a framework, you know, of, uh, of model supported uh, a framework or a, a, a a particular tool or, or, or heuristic or principle. And, and that guides behavior. So one of the things that we should be thinking about is how those approaches, methodologies, and tools actually are changing things. Yeah? Uh, um, and of course, um, there is work on that that uh, has been published. You, know, you can find it in, in, in our journals. It's, it's not that new. They don't call it behavioral OR, but that's what they're doing, in my book at least. Uh, so, uh, um, just to give you an illustration, in this particular study, which was published in System Dynamics Review, uh, they wanted to know, uh, for people who were using a System Dynamics model to make decisions, uh, what effect would have if you provide feedback, intermediate feedback, about the results of the simulation. So you're running this simulation model, you're getting some results, you're using that, to inform subsequent decisions. And they did an experimental study, and the idea was to find the best strategy. And they did this, so individuals were, were you know, doing these things independent of each other, uh, but uh, all the answers and the feedback of all people working on this problem will be available to everybody. So you can pick the best information and then use it for your next round of, of decisions. And what they discovered in this, in this study is that the use of feedback, group feedback in this case, um, in addition to using the model, uh, positively influenced convergence of the decision process and also contributed to higher individual performance. So for me, what guided behavior in this case was a model, but in addition to that was information feedback. Okay? And the impact of that was higher performance and so on. So for me, it's just a standard uh, behavioral study where you are looking at the effect of methods. Yeah? Now, uh, not many, uh, um, you know, uh, system dynamics is a discipline that does that a lot. So if you look at system dynamics um, uh, papers or journals, there's a lot of this type of work. So they have a, a long history of this. Um, but there are also others. You know, in decision analysis, long history as well in terms of developing models and seeing what happens in terms of decision making. Uh, if you go into um, you know, the softer end of OR, there is also some work, not a lot, uh, uh, where people have tried to experimentally measure whether there are changes in the way you reach consensus or you change your mind or learn something uh, as a result of using a particular methodology. So there's a study in EJOR where they look at the impact of uh, the oval mapping technique, which is a mapping technique, just uh, you know, in f and flip charts and you know, manual, manual based. And they did a two-day simulation task. They got actually real, real managers you know, to work on a problem that mattered to them. Uh, and they tried to uh, 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 understand whether using the method had any you know, uh, impacts on terms of integration, collaboration, consensus, and so on. Uh, the, the, the results were a little mixed. Um, li there was little impact w when there was high conflict, but there was le more impact when the more in focus on information exchange, less conflict. Now, as a result, for the software community, that was terrible. Because soft the software community claims that 
actually, when high, if there is high conflict, that's what we, our methods actually work better. And this result was then the opposite. Of course, the argument, you know, as it happens, was that there was an experiment and it was not real and so on. I am a little bit more pragmatic about these things. I think there's always something you can learn from these experiments. Uh, and, and so, but then again, in this case, over mapping technique, guiding behavior, and you're trying to understand the input. So that's, you can find those things. Uh, 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 they don't call it behavioral art, but it's, it's behavioral art in my book, at least. So that's that. What we don't find too much. <coughs> yeah. Yes. yes, sorry. I don't mean to interrupt you from your. In your Absolutely, time you can interrupt me anytime. Questions come into my mind. Sure. Uh, one of them, uh, so where you draw the line? For example, there are many people who are doing uh, modeling, for example, corruption. Yeah. Does that count into, for example, this discipline? Um, if you are trying to model uh, behavior and you're modeling, you're modeling corruption and in the model you have behavioral variables, I would say that counts in so far as you are interested in seeing a change somewhere. And this is the, this is the, the, the key. I think sometimes you find a lot of modeling, but um, for it to be, you know, a, a, more relevant to behavioral art, it, need it needs to be related to a change in something, either in behavior of, of a real system, or you know, I need to see the effects on, on, on the system or on the client or something. Otherwise, it's just a good exercise, but it's just half of the story. That's, that's the way I would say. Okay. And also, in this model, does the effect of synergy count? Is there any way to basically count that in? Mm. That's always a big problem, isn't it? What do you mean? Um, how to how to calculate the synergy? How to take into account the effects of that into people's interaction? Okay, so that but that is, that is a very specific question of modeling, which I will I'm happy to comment, but let's let's wait until perhaps the coffee break, because otherwise we're gonna we're gonna end up just uh, um, doing very specific ways. But but thank you very much for your question. Um, okay, so that's fine. Um, what I I was saying um, that we don't do much is. Other methods that might be relevant in OR that also guide behavior. And I'm not talking here about the models, but I'm talking about, for example, the scripts uh, or the routines that, you, that people use to build models. You know, you have your script, you know how to build your model. Uh, does that count? How does that affect the way you interact with your client, for example? We, we, we hardly hear anything. We, we, we hear a lot about scripts. These are the best things, these are the guidelines to do this type of modeling. But we don't see the, the, the impact of those scripts in actual behavior. Very little, at least. Uh, communication strategies, apart from, uh, from Rymo's paper, I hardly see many papers, for example, that say the way we report results actually makes these changes. I am doing, at the moment, a project uh, with one of my PhD students, which is looking exactly at that. We're looking at project briefings between clients and analysts. We're looking at prog progress review meetings between clients and analysts and reporting results. And uh, of course, what they are reporting is the results of running models. But the model is, uh, there, might, there might be models present sometimes in some meetings, but sometimes there's not. It's just the way analysts are trying to sort of uh, pitch a, 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 a project or justify a decision and so on. And, that we don't see much, and I think that's very important because, uh, you know, those are the things that you will be dealing with when you are working with clients. Yeah. <laughs> and if we and, and reading, you cannot read about it, but uh, you need to experience it. But nevertheless, even if you want to read about it, you don't find it. The textbook is 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 is, is absent in terms of uh, uh, commenting on these sort of things. And the same norms and procedures, you know, what, what sort of uh, principles you use and so on. So we, we hear little about that. Now, the next one is um, not only focusing on, 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 on methods, but also focusing on actors, you know. Uh, so whose actor count, uh, whose uh, behavior counts, uh, relates to, well, who are the actors? And for us, actors are all those individuals who, uh, on their own, or as part of a team, or of an organization, are designing, implementing, or engaging with an OR supported process. So that means that we don't only have to focus on practitioners, but practitioners are obviously a big part. 
And in fact, most of the stuff that we read about interventions that use OR are basically accounts written by practitioners or academic practitioners. I did this and this is what happened. Yeah? So we, we, we do have that. Uh, but and what I'm interested in now is, is, is what, what type of practitioners are we really studying? And you will find that in the simulation field, what people have published about is the differences between experts who are modeler, uh, modelers that, who are experts versus uh, novices, you know, modelers who are novices. And the, the interesting bit is that, you know, if we can find the gaps and the differences, then we can, we can spot, uh, you know, areas in which we can develop training for novices. And so they did this uh, 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 study where they compare novices and experts, uh, modelers, uh, using discrete event simulation and, and system dynamic simulation. And they find particular differences. They, they have differences. They, they, they focus the way they think about problems and so on. You may, you may say, well, that was kind of obvious but because they're using different things. Yes, but at least they are producing empirical evidence that we can use rather than just, you know, talking about it. So uh, in this case, uh, um, these are a particular type of actors. But they are not the only actors that you should consider. So we should also consider, you know, clients, you know, what clients actually say about, uh, you know, these projects. Sponsors, you know, the sponsors make a big, big difference to an OR project. We hear very little about that. And of course, users as well. So uh, we need more of that. Um, there's little on that, and we need to sort of increase the uh, diversity of, of actors that are considered. Uh, when we talk about clients, for example, in those case studies about OR uh, interventions, uh, usually uh, uh, are uh, uh, based on uh, interviewing those who participated in, in the research, which is fine. But mostly, if you look carefully about case studies in OR, they're usually post hoc reflections by somebody who did the project. And the, the problem with that is that you know, memory can be tricky. You know? it can, you can embellish things. You can see things, you know, with uh, rose tinted glasses. So uh, that can be an issue. So the impact of actors' behavior, you know, gets intertwined with the impact that the methods are using. So it's not the methods only; it's who uses them or who applies them, and so on. So both things are important. And the final thing, which we actually, you know, very little we we know about, I would argue, is uh, what I call OR praxis. Praxis is basically. The, the, you know, when you are actually using uh, an OR method in situ. So how many, uh, how many accounts of practice do we really have in our journals? Almost, almost zero, I would say. We don't, we, we don't really have uh, an account of, what, of data that comes from the actual use of uh, an OR method. Very, very little. And, and that's something that we could learn about uh, or learn from a lot. So when I'm talking about praxis, you know, if you do an OR project, modeling is just one little activity of the project. There's a lot of things that are going on with your client at different levels of the organization. You know, lots of if you have a big team, lots of conversations between, you know, the partner of the project or the senior manager or the chief analyst and the actual modeler. There's a lot of things that are happening lots of meetings and so on, most visibly, you, will f you can single out particular episodes. You can single out, for example, modeling sessions, or you can single out meetings you know, in which a model is used, uh, or, 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 or as I said, you know, design sessions, for example. And, and, and how many of us actually have read anything about how those sessions actually go? Very little. Uh, we, when we read about OR, we read how to model, usually, and then we start our project and we said, I'm ready to model, but you realize that actually you still cannot model because there's a lot of things that you, need, you didn't know about because you need, nobody told you about and you can only experience that. So I think there's a big gap there. Um, there are some studies, but very, very few. So I'm talking about studies where you are actually looking at actual projects. I'm not talking about experiments. So this study I did with one of my collaborators where what we did is we look at how facilitated modeling is used in workshops, you know? So this is about building models on the hoof in a workshop with a team. 
And what we're trying to do is, is say, well, you know, one of the claims of these type of approaches is that they produce new knowledge. So I said, well, let's, let's see if they produce new knowledge. And the problem that we had is that we cannot ask after the workshop, did you learn something new? Because people will say either no, and the problem with that is sometimes they have this bias, they're thinking, well, they, they, they're thinking that they knew it all along, but actually they didn't, but they tell you, no, I didn't learn anything. Or they tell you what you want to hear. So, so, so that's a tricky one. So the only way you can actually do it is by recording the data of the workshop as it happens and see what happens. So we did that. Uh, at the time, the limitation was that we couldn't video it, but we had the whole, all the recordings. And we looked into uh, how knowledge uh, is created, and we looked into theories of knowledge creation and so on. And we basically coded every single interaction and tried to find points in the interaction where new concepts were introduced or not. And we tried to understand that in terms of what people were saying and actually the role of the artifact, in this case the model, in the conversation. So we discovered two different patterns. One pattern was what we call the collaborative pattern, where people were really very open-minded about things. And so the, 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 I'm going to talk about that more later on today. But uh, the way they were speaking was conducive to new knowledge. And the role of the model was triggering sort of a, a, an open inquiry sort of a, a atmosphere. But there was other patterns in the same workshop with the same facilitator, the same analyst, same team, where the pattern was a little bit more assertive and there was no new knowledge and there was all knowledge being recycled and recycled again. And the model was used not to create new knowledge but to fix the knowledge, non-negotiable. Very interesting, same workshop, different patterns. Was, was the workshop successful or not? Well, it depends on the balance, you see, how much new knowledge you get as opposed to all knowledge. That's what I call praxis. You have to go closer to this. And of course, if you look at this and you read about this, you think, ah, oh, actually, it's not that easy to do facilitated modeling. It's quite complex. Um, there are other ways of doing this, of course. Um, Richard Ormerod uh, um, wrote not so long ago a very interesting account of uh, a 10-year project, I think it was, uh, an OR in, in government. And, uh, and what he did is uh, he, he used uh, a theory, the theor a theory of practice, called the Mangal of practice. Um, as a solo, it's called Pickering. And uh, basically, he said, in a project, you know, you have different elements, human elements, and material elements, and technical elements, and so on. And all of them are really, really a mangle of things. And if you want to understand why the project went the way it went, you need to find and sort of uh, deconstruct the project using these different concepts. And he did that. Uh, and, and the account is very interesting. So it gives you a much better idea of how complex an OR project of this scale, because it was a large scale project, was. So that's practice, again. So uh, for me, the practice speed is one of the most interesting areas. That, that's a personal choice because it can highlight the gap between textbook OR and OR as it happens on the ground. You know, I, we teach uh, in, in, in our university, and we train future analysts, and we train them to model, you know, do you know, hard OR, stats, you know, optimization, simulation, and they learn statistical analysis, you know, and they learn to be good modelers. Would they be good OR analysts in practice? It's a big question mark. Because if we're not teaching them anything about how things actually work for real, there's a big, big gap. So if you, if you, if you, you know, what's the sort of a, the, the standard, uh, you know, uh, a script for, for modeling? Define the problem, define the objectives, you know, develop options, you know, test the model. Does it, does it really happen like that in practice? No, it doesn't. You know that. You, you know that even now. So, so how does it happen then? You know? What do I have to take into account before I go and start my first project? So for me, this is a great opportunity. We know we have uh, papers about OR practice, but we don't have papers of OR practice, if you know what I mean. And so that's a key, key, key gap. So the argument so far is that you know, if you want to have an holistic picture that considers behavior in OR, well, you need to look at three things. You know. Uh, who are the actors? What are the methods? 
and, and how are they used. Yeah? Those three things. And, uh, and again, this is inspired by, um, by this series of practice, um, which are very relevant to behavioral law. So Ryan and I had a lot of uh, you know, um, rounds around this figure. Uh, we wrote a, a, a book chapter on this. Uh, and um, I'm hopefully gonna, gonna continue working on this. But the idea is that this is a framework which more or less summarizes how would you go about doing behavioral OR. Um, basically, the, the three key concepts are there. You know, actors, methods, and praxis. And of course, they will have an impact on outcomes. Uh, and, and they are all, of course, intertwined. Analytically, I'm separating them, but in practice, they are all mix, you know, mixed. Um, and also, obviously, they are embedded within a particular context. And so that's, that's true. Uh, but also, uh, outcomes will have a feedback effect. You know? If you have a successful outcome, it may mean that in the future, you become more competent as an analyst, you know? or you become more competent as a user. Or as a client, you may like repeat business and you want more modeling done in your organization. So that's, that's an effect. And also, uh, you know, obviously, if your outcomes uh, you know, are good or bad, that will inform your methods. You may create new methods. You, know? you, may, uh, you may improve your methods. You may discard methods. So there are feedback effects. Um, now, I rarely see any behavioral OR paper, what I would consider behavioral OR paper, that doesn't do these things. They all do these things, but the emphasis is different. So some will uh, you know, focus only on methods. Some will focus only on, 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 on praxis, you know, perhaps. Um, usually it's about methods. Uh, but for me, to make it a behavioral OR study, it has to be linked to outcomes. If there are no outcomes, then, then that's only half of the story. So what this framework is trying to do is to provide an entry point for people to study. How do you do it? It's, it's up for grabs. You can do experiments, you can do case studies, you can do simulations, you can do whatever. But it, it is a choice, okay? So um, if you focus on methods, for example, uh, you, uh, um, you, will, you will be interested in, in the outcomes in terms of, you know, if you are just modeling behavior, you are interested in the outcomes of running the, the model, you know? How the system is changing, you know? When you do AJ-based simulation, you don't know the, the, the outcome because you are interested in these emerging patterns, you know? So you, you code the model, your, your simulation model and you see, ah, this is what's happening at the end. So you're interested in that. Uh, or you're interested in changes in cognition or in attitudes or in interaction, you know? In decision analysis, there is a, 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 an insistent dynamics. There's a great tradition you know, on, doing, on doing that. In fact, in decision analysis, what they have done is, in terms of methods, they look at different elicitation protocols and how different elicitation protocols for expert judgments actually divide you know, those, uh, those judgments. So there's, there's that. So that's, that's, that's one point of entry. There are people already doing that, and we want more, because there's always room for more of this. Uh, but as I said earlier, what we have less about is how other type of methods, not only the models, but also the scripts, the routines, your communication strategies with clients, how does that affect the outcome? Um, teaching, you know, teaching and training. How many uh, teaching and training actually papers you see? You know, I have trained and teach these people in this way and this is the result. And they are more competent or less competent or whatever. So we can do that as well. That would be behavioral law too. That's one focus. If, on the other hand, you want to focus on actors, yes. I mentioned expert and novice modelers, you know, uh, have been used in, in, in simulation studies, but also in forecasting studies, you know, in the, in the special issue on behavioral OR this year, there is a study that looks at, you know, expert forecasters, for example, or, or managers, uh, decision analysis. Uh, there is, a, within OR, there is a, a community that looks at strat strategic OR, and then they look at how analysts are doing strategic OR, and so on. So that's, that's one. But um, uh, what, what me for, 
What would be interesting, is mentioned your comment earlier, is how the same method, you know, may actually lead to different outcomes because that depends on the competence of the user or the analyst, you know. Uh, the style, you know, how, you know, some people are, you know, they have particular cognitive styles. Uh, uh, one of my papers uh, earlier this year was about the need for closure, how some people with high need for closure actually use the model differently from those who are low for need for closure. Um, your consulting approach, you know, are you the kind of uh, analyst who presents, you know, himself or herself as an expert? Do you sell, you know, uh, as a doctor-patient relationship with your client? Or are you the kind of person who presents yourself as a co-creator of solutions? Yeah, you're going to facilitate this. That will also affect your outcomes. Uh, and obviously, status and authority, you know, depending who is in the room, that, that has an impact on, on your project. So, yes, there is a lot of, uh, you know, uh, already o o on, on actors or our actors' uh, studies, but I think uh, we can do more about this. You know, in other fields, there is studies uh, along those areas, but um, we need to do more in our. And in practice, as I said, yes, if you look at actual practice, as it happens, moment by moment, then you will accept that actually uh, our work is, is, is very complex. Uh, still underexplored, uh, some exceptions I mentioned, there are others as well. Uh, and the idea is that um, in my experience with the work that I'm doing on practice at the moment, for example, uh, you will see deviations from expected behaviors. Are they bad or not? It depends. They are bad if, you know, uh, perhaps the outcomes are, uh, don't adhere to what seems to be reasonably, you know, uh, a, a good framework of decision making. But sometimes what happens is users and analysts improvise. And, you know, and, they, and they use methods in ways that they were not intended to be used for. But they create a new use. And that's very powerful. So you're creating basically a new methodology by being an uh, innovative one. So those deviations, you can only know if you do research like this. Because you need to see what is actually happening. Why is that people are using this particular data envelope analysis framework in a different way? How, how did that happen? How did that come about? How can I learn about that? So that's that. Now, methodological issues. Um, I don't think it's a single way of, of doing behavioral OR. And I think Raymond and I are very clear on that. We like to embrace that eclecticism. Okay? Uh, and, and I think uh, you, you could learn a lot from how other scholars in other fields have studied change, okay? Uh, because OR is basically about changing something. Isn't it? We're modeling something because we want to make things better. The science of better, that's what they call it. Uh, uh, and by that we mean we want, we want to make things to work a little bit better, yeah? yeah. And so if we're trying to change things. If that is the case, then uh, what can we learn about studies of change? If you look into how people have studied change, they have studied change in different, different ways. Uh, and um, the work of uh, Scott Poole and Van de Ven, two American professors, is quite inspirational in that sense. Because they basically say, um, if you are trying to understand and examine change, whether it's change in an individual, or in a group, or in an organization, it depends what your stance is in terms of uh, uh, how you view reality. So some scholars, they, they think that you know, organizations, for example, are basically all about entities who will change, but will remain the same. So somebody, you know, uh, a, a child goes to school, does an entity, he goes through school and he learns a lot, he's changing cognitively, but he's the same child at the end. Uh, um, so if you, if you look at that sort of a, what I call substantive ontology, then there is a particular way of studying behavior. Um, if you, on the other hand, assume that organizations are all processes really, and change is really a judgment. 
what changes and what not depends on who's talking and who's analyzing the change. If you, are, if, you, if you are talking to those who are in the system, they might tell you one story. If you are outside the system and you are judging the system, you're telling a different story. So uh, reality in that case is something that is a little bit more in flux. And again, if you're looking at that, then there are different ways of doing that. And the different ways that, they, the, that they've been using for a standard change, they call it the variance approach or the process approach. And the various approach is something that all our people, like ourselves, feel very comfortable with. Because it's about causal, you know, cause and effect. You know. What are the independent variables? What are the dependent variables? And we're going to analyze that. So if you are you know, having a, to assume a substantive ontology, and you're using the, the, the variance approach, you do an, a sort of a standard causal modeling analysis. You, know? you do a regression or you do some sort of uh, structural equation modeling or some sort of cause and effect study. Uh, and you are trying to measure the change. And all the studies about learning, for example, using system dynamics are like that. You're trying to a change in mental model. That's what you're trying to, you're, you're measuring that in the group or in the individual. And then you're doing an experiment. You know, that's one way of doing it. On the other hand, if you assume you know, reality, you know, from a processual point of view, everything is in flux, you know, change is really relative depending on who is judging it, then you can still do uh, uh, modeling, but the kind of modeling that you do is much more complex. So agent-based modeling tries to trace change, you know, uh, uh, so the entity is changing all the time, the processes are changing all the time, and we actually can, we cannot know in advance, we need to run a simulation. So that sort of complex modeling, that would be on the top right there, you know, modeling studies. And again, those of, uh, uh, of us who are working with, with that sort of modeling will be fitting that, that sort of uh, study. And you do experiments and so on. In this case, it would be simulation type uh, uh, of work. Now, the process approach is different. The process approach doesn't try to measure change, uh, you know, before and after. What a process approach is trying to do is to see how change came about. How is that we moved from point A in time to point B? What really happened? And so uh, you would be interested in, for example, somebody or a team, let's say, or, or an individual who is using a particular model, what process, what thinking process or behavioral process you know, this per individual or team went through to reach the final point. Of course, you want to measure that final point, but you also want to measure the process. And you have two ways of doing that. If what you're assuming is that before and after, the individual or team organization is exactly the same, it's just that there are changes happening inside the person but, or, the, or, the, or the entity, but the entity doesn't change, then you can do fairly, fairly quantitative analysis of sequence. You know, using Markov process changes or using interaction analysis of different sorts. Uh, and so, you know, you would, you would have to borrow many of the methodologies, interaction methodologies that have been developing, for example, in human communication research or in social psychology, for example. And you, you, will, you, will, you will see, for example, um, you can say, uh, just to, just to uh, refer to my previous example, uh, decision making, you know, the rational approach is, you know, you define the problem, define the objectives, you know, develop options, test, and decide. If that is the case, if I go and do this, you know, problem solving exercise with a team, do we really go like that? Probably not. Probably there's going to be a lot of, you know, you know, cycle, you know, moving forwards and backwards. But there will be some teams that will be more linear than others. And the interesting bit will be which ones are more successful or not. So trying to trace that developmental process would be a process approach in the bottom left with a sequence study. You can do it. Now, the final one, the bottom right, is the one that is the more qualitative in nature. Okay? For that, you are assuming that you can't really quantify the developmental process. It's too complex, everything is too intertwined. It's very difficult to deconstruct 
the use of models, the interaction with clients, the users, and so on. So there is already a little, a small literature on social material studies of OR processes. Uh, the, the example I gave you about the, the mangle of practice that Richard Ormer talked about would fit that category. So what you are trying to do is not, not, finding a, 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 not quantifying the developmental process, but to produce a narrative of actually what happened, a narrative that makes sense. Okay? You still do coding and you still have to analyze you know, empirical data, but it would be a narrative. It's a little bit you know, so softer than that. So, Raimo and I think that those four categories are, um, are pretty, pretty uh, uh, complementary with each other. They are not, none of them will give you an answer. They will give you uh, uh, the answer. They will give you an answer. Okay? And so it's, 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 you, can, you can engage, uh, whether you are focusing on actors or on methods or on practice, you can engage in behavioral or are doing any of those things. Um, um, we make this very clear because um, there is, you know, when we started this, this journey, um, there, was, there, was, there was some you know, voices in the community who, for example, would claim that behavioral art is what they were doing all the time. You know? So, you know, uh, in soft OR, they were saying, we've been doing this all the time. Well, if you look at it in, through these lens, lens senses, I would say, not really. You know, uh, um, and um, um, system dynamics people have been doing this for a long time. That's true, but it's only just part of the whole. You know? and the same with decision analysis. So, they're all telling a story and all useful stories. Uh, and where are you in this grid? in your work, I would be very much interested to hear your own versions of how would you place your studies there. I have already an opinion because I have read your applications, but you, know, you, might, you might confirm that or you might prove me wrong. Right, so what are the implications then of, of a behavioral art perspective? Well, my first implication is let's continue doing what we really do well, but let's also try to do a little bit more on the praxis. I'm very, very keen on this because we, we know very little about what really goes on in an OR project or a modeling project. Um, one of the things that I find fascinating is uh, there was a paper in the special issue uh, uh, on behavioral art this year that focused on how a team of analysts decided on what and which way they were going to do the project with the client. So there was no modeling there, they were just deciding. But that decision has enormous implications for the way the project is going to go. So, uh, if you look at what do we have at the moment, you know, if you if you are very new to the field and you have a problem that is very complex, has material elements, has subjective elements, has social elements, you know, how do you design this intervention? Well, you're going to have to do a lot of methods, perhaps, you know, in combination. So you have to look at the literature on multi-methodology, for example, you know. Multi methods. How do you mix and match? And if you look at that literature, there's a lot of uh, very nice frameworks that they tell you, oh, you know, when you have a problem like this, you need a method like that, a problem like that, and so on. But of course, that mapping is quite complex because, um, you know, how do you know that it's this and not that? You know, it's very, very complex to apply those, uh, those grids in practice. It's not impossible, but, you know, it's useful, it's useful as a discussion, but it, it is complex. So what these guys were doing in this study is, uh, well, let's say how actually it really happens in practice. How do practitioners actually do it? And, and, and they discovered particular patterns which were quite useful uh, in, in order to understand how people were actually thinking in terms of design. Um, and how particular actors, in that case uh, the, the team leader actually uh, had a huge influence in the way the design worked. And that type of uh, literature, we don't have much, but we should have more. Because we will learn a lot about how projects actually go about in practice. Um, evaluating the impact of diverse actors is important as well. As I said, we need to uh, increase the number of accounts or studies that look at many actors, not only the analysts. Um, again, the other implication would be related to the previous one is that um, we will know that the, the outcomes um, uh, of an OR intervention will depend very much on the competencies of not only the analyst who is building the models,
but also the user and the client. And what competencies are required is something that it would be very interesting to explore. There are, of course, uh, you know, lots of uh, uh, studies about competencies, uh, but most of them tend to be um, um, guidelines that are advocated by particular methods or particular you know, uh, ideas. But what I would like to see is more empirical research showing competencies as, and, and being tested. Uh, whether you are doing it with a case study or whether you do it with an experiment, I don't mind, but uh, we need more, more uh, empirical uh, studies on that. Uh, and the last one is that whichever focus you choose for a behavioral art studies, you need to look into theory somewhere. Because this is, we can't, your studies cannot be a theoretical. Unless they're purely methodological, but even so, uh, uh, even those who, for example, are modeling just systems, I, I just heard very recently uh, um, Professor Sally Brailsford came to Loughborough to present her work in health stimulation. And she was show, showcasing her work, and she was trying to simulate uh, um, uh, the, wh what makes people um, um, uh, screen, you know, uh, go and have a screening uh, 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 for cancer earlier or not. And in order to do that, she, she looked at data and so on, but she was looking for theories. And, and, and she looked at theories, for example, of intention. What makes somebody do something according to intention? And there are theories about that, and she used that to call her model. So that, that's a, a very good example of a quantitative modeling approach informed by a, a theory of behavior. And in this case, it was a behavior about intention, so it was even pre. And then she ran that. And she used that to provide recommendations about when do you need to remind people about well, what the screen and so on. So we need that. Yeah. Uh, one question. In the case you record the workshop, do the participants know that they are being to record it? That's very good. Uh, you, you can do that only after, obviously, yes, the, for, of, the, answer is, the quick answer is yes, they do know it. Mm -hmm. But, uh, um, uh, and the second, the second point is that you need to do it with, with, when there is trust and, uh, and good rapport with these people. In my experience, I mean, people tend to say, oh, would they act up for the camera or whatever? After the first five, ten minutes, they forget the camera and they can do whatever. They swear, they, they get into fights. And, but you need to obviously negotiate that access. Uh, so that's the challenge. That's why if I were a PhD student, I'd rather do an experiment, perhaps, because I can control it. Because if I want to do these big cases, I don't know where it's going to go, you know, and, and where I'm going to get the access and so on. So that, it's a bit tricky. But sometimes, you know, the study I'm doing with my PhD for meetings, I have a good relationship with that client. And so I have been able to secure not only the funding of the PhD, but also access to all these meetings because actually the client wants to improve the way they communicate with the clients. But definitely there's an element of Hawthorne effect present whatever you do if they know that they are being recorded. Well, that, that you, you can say that. You can, you can say no design is perfect. You know? So, uh, as I said, trying to you know, draw again on, on my pragmatism about the subject. Yes, of course, it would be very nice to control every single variable, but, but with that then you're not going to do anything. You know? So, with, with, the, with those caveats, yeah, you, you can do it. Yeah. I think uh, uh, video data is something that is very difficult, but if you can get access to it, we can learn so much. You know? particularly those who want to start in the field anew. So, my conclusion then, um, as Raimo said, um, yeah, OR is never just about modeling and models, it's also about people. Okay. Um, and I would say you should, rather than saying oh, OR is only about, behavioral OR is only about you know, changing mental models or biases and risks uh, or the bias in techniques or it's only about you know uh, simulation no it, it's, it's all of that all of that have a function and we can all learn from, from that in the end we're all concerned with the same thing we want to change things for better uh, 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 how we do it is, is really up for that. so um, so you have some choices you can focus on methods you can focus on, on, on actors or you can focus on practice you can focus on all of them. In fact, you, you basically do it if you're doing a real project, but you will have to give salience or prominence to perhaps some of them. You have to foreground something and background something. 
um, but connected to outcomes. You know, that's the key, connected to outcomes. Um, how do you do it? Again, it's up to you. You can do experiments, but you can do other things as well. You can do case studies, you can do action research. You know. um, of course, the challenges for us or our people is that if we are going and to, to do things like case studies and, and, and sort of uh, um, uh, ethnographies or interaction analysis, we're going to have to get trained in something else because we're not trained naturally on those areas. We have to borrow from others. But uh, we can learn so much if we do that. But carry on with experiments as well. It does obviously is, is important too. Um, so what we think are offering with these studies, well, my first um, point was empirically driven insights. You know, so um, it's not about just talking, it's about showing you know, uh, uh, with data. So empirically grounded explanations of how actors are using methods in their practice you know, and what the impacts are. Um, and so if we could, you know, as ultimately impossible task but aspirational nevertheless, produce a theory of our practice, that will you know, improve practice and increase actors' competencies, then, then that would be a good goal to have. Uh, and that's, so everything that we're trying to do, in our view, is trying to contribute to develop that sort of a theory of effective practice. Maybe, as I said, unachievable, but you know, as, as an aspiration, is something I think uh, is, is, is worth pursuing. Um, and I think that with that, this half us almost half past uh, then, so can we just take a break? And this is all I have to say. If you have any questions, just shut up, yeah? <laughs>